I'm Charlotte McLeod with investingnews.com and here today with me is Craig Hemke, publisher of tfmetalsreport.com. Thank you so much for being here. Great to have you. Hey, Charlotte. Thanks for having me on again. It's always nice to visit with you. Really good to be catching up with you. And we're picking up from our last conversation all the way back in, I believe, April. So one reason I got in touch is when we talked at that time, you'd mentioned the 2650 to 2700 per ounce level for gold as a technical target we should be watching. So now we're, we're essentially in that range. So I wanted to come back and ask you what happens next. Right. I was hoping you could tell me. Broad question. Yeah, I was hoping you could tell me. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's the challenge, you know. Um, you know, you look at like silver, for example. We can look at a chart of silver and go back and see, you know, what had been support and what had been resistance years ago, and we can look forward and say, okay, well, you can kind of see well, it might be the same now with gold or really anything else when it's making new all-time highs. How do you try to project, you know, where you might run into the next resistance? And so, and that's challenging. And so that number of uh, 2650, 2675 ish, uh, that came about from my discussions with a technical analyst by the name of Christopher Mullen, who, you know, these technicians, they'll use Fibonacci, they call it Fibonacci extensions, this high to this low, and then you plot it out the same amount, you know, and all this. And I, I don't know. Heck, that sounds like a good idea as anything else. And so using that method, both the weekly and the monthly chart projected, you know, if you got through 24 and 2,500, that the next major resistance would be up around 2,650. And here we are. Now we moved all the way up. I think the December contract got all the way to 2,708. So we moved through there. And so you might even be thinking it now is, you know, we're pulling back and testing that level of support. But again, I, technical analysis when you're in this area of new all-time highs is pretty tough to do. And so I, you know, it doesn't surprise me that we've kind of paused here, but gosh, um, things could change pretty rapidly, uh, both economically and geopolitically in the next few days. And so, I mean, all bets are off as to where, you know, how much further we might be able to go. Right. So not surprising to see a pause here. That makes a lot of sense to me as well. But have you been surprised at how quickly the gold price is moving in 2024? Oh, my gosh, Charlotte. Isn't that crazy? And when you mentioned it was April that we spoke last. And I'm first of all, I'm thinking, I thought it was a couple of weeks ago. You know, I mean, where, where the time goes, I have no idea. Um, but if we go back to April, it's been an interesting study of things since then, you know, because Gold had, had tried to break out all the way back on the 1st of December last year. And then it immediately got reversed and it took about 90 days to kind of get its act together and then blast higher. And it broke out on Friday, March the 1st, got above 2100. And then over the next, I mean, five or six weeks, went all the way up to 2400 and beyond. I mean, it was just this tremendous move. And so when we spoke back then, you know, it had been the high, maybe it moved a little higher in May and silver rushed to catch up. And then it was kind of like, well, we went sideways and price came down and kind of double bottomed in the middle of June. And then boom, it blasted off, broke out again. And, and now here we are. Um, am I surprised? The, the surprising thing is that it has kind of gone up regardless of the normal things that might make buying or selling happen on a daily basis. You know, when, when the year began, uh, you know, we'd go back to New Year's Eve, everybody, you know, all the big macro strategists and economists, you know, the Wall Street firms were all talking about, oh, there might be six rate cuts. There might be seven rate cuts from the Fed next year. And I was like, I, well, the Fed is saying maybe two or three, and I don't see where the economy is that week. So you figured that had to come in some, and it did. And by June, they were talking about maybe only one. And then the dollar index was down around 100. And you figure, and you know, you figure that might bounce. And it went all the way to 107. And you would think under that environment that gold would have gone down. And instead, gold goes up, and breaks out, you know, and does all this. And so then now the Fed is starting to cut. <laughs> and gold is moving even higher. Um my, one of the things I think about a lot is what, what am I missing? 
you know, we, we continue to see central bank demand at very high levels, uh, record levels for the last couple of years in a row. And that seems to be continuing this year. But what, what could be driving this not, almost nonstop bid for gold? Um, you know, one of the things, you know, we've got like, for example, we've got this BRICS summit that's coming up later this month. And there's all this speculation that they're going to announce that they're at least thinking about, you know, establishing their own trading currency and then that, that might have a gold component to it. Maybe, maybe that's it. And that, you know, behind the scenes, all the countries that would participate in that are stockpiling their own gold reserves. I, you know, that's one of those things I guess we'll only know with hindsight, but it, boy, what a, what a fascinating year it has been. And we still have 90 days left to go. Yeah, I think so. Maybe you can help me out with the historical context for gold. You know, based on what you're saying, this is pretty different than what we've seen in previous gold bull markets. Would you say that's the case? I know it's dangerous to say, you know, this time is different, but what, what do you think? Well, you know, um, Ronnie Sturfela, uh is a guy that with his team, they produce this In Gold We Trust report every May. And in there, he usually has a chart of uh, annualized returns of gold in eight or nine, the big eight or nine major fiat currencies. And so it, it's a great table to look at. And, and you can see, and he goes back to the year 2000. And you can see you know, there's green years, there's red years, you know. Annualized, it's about 9% in dollar terms since the year 2000. And you, you know, there, there's, I think the biggest year maybe was 2010 or 2011, where it was like 28%, 26%. Year to date, we're up like 30. And so that gives you some idea of, you know, uh, how unusual a year like this is. You know, people think, well, you know, gold only goes up 10% a year. Well, you know, that's okay in most circumstances. Um, you don't mind making 10, having it go up 10% a year. Going up 30 is what's unusual. And so uh, if we continue, if we just hold here, but if we continue even higher, that again, it's so unusual that it makes you wonder, you know, what, again, what am I missing? What's what's going on the behind the scenes that is setting this year apart from all of these others, making it, you know, this anomaly. But it has been uh, spectacular and it is very unusual. Silver, you know, probably the most frustrating thing for a lot of investors is silver is kind of playing along and the mining shares are playing along even less than silver is. Um Gold continues higher. They'll even, you know, I mean, they'll all they'll all catch up eventually. But uh, for now, yeah, gold is a star, and surprise, you know, just not surprisingly so, but amazingly so. Right. I remember when we talked previously, you had mentioned, you know, if you want to see your mining shares really go up, you probably need to see silver move first. So. Like you mentioned, we have seen silver start to move. Mining stocks are are on the move. Any further thoughts there on where when that might kick off a little bit more in earnest? Yeah, this this is one of those things that's just a life in the twenty first century. You know, I, I've seen uh, things on Twitter and you know other reports that say you know eighty percent, sometimes more than that, of New York Stock Exchange volume on a daily basis is just high frequency trading. You know, where these firms are trying to nick each other for fractions of a penny. And um, and so, it, you know, when it's all so much is done by algorithm, you can get these kind of funny correlations. And one that I anybody that's in the mining sector should take a look. Go to a website where you can plot two things together. I like I use barchart.com and you can pull up, you know, an interactive chart where you can plot, you know, put in the SLV and put in the GDX and plot them at the same time. And it's a remarkable correlation. I mean, like, it's got to be higher than 95%. And you're like, well, that didn't make any sense. GDX is supposed to be major gold producers. Uh, the, the closest thing you have to a gold producer on that, I think the uh, Pan American silver is like the 12th or 13th largest holding. So why would silver and this gold miner ETF be so closely correlated? It doesn't make any sense. But the, your eyes, I mean, you can't, they don't lie. Right. You can see it on the chart. So it's pretty easy to deduce that if you want silver to really get rolling uh, or you want the shares to get rolling, you need silver to go up. Um, 
again, I mean, the GDX is at 41. It's all time high was 55 back in August of 2011. Well, it was silver back in August, 2011, 40, you know, and here silver is at 30. So uh, it's just, a, you know, one of these strange things about the investment world at this point. Um, I, when we spoke back in April, I would imagine we, I mean, silver was already starting to move, but I remember being asked a lot in March and into early April, you know, gold had taken off. Why the heck wasn't silver going up? Because silver was still 24, 25. And I remember telling people, saying, you know, it will. I mean, if gold goes to 2,500, silver is not going to stay at 25. I mean, it's just not. It's not going to be a 100 to 1 gold-silver ratio. And so, lo and behold, yeah, bang. Beginning 1st of April till the middle of May, silver went from 24 to 33. And so now silver, again, here gold's moving higher versus where it was in May. But silver still isn't back to where it was in May. Gold keeps going. Silver will eventually move as well. And when silver moves, the mining shares will move. Strange as that may sound. It is it is a little bit strange sounding, but I'll I'll go take a look at that chart as well. Cause like you said, you know, if Amazing. you see it, it's it's hard to deny if you have it right in front of you. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so that's pretty interesting. And I think Maybe going back to some price drivers for gold and probably as well as silver, we should probably take a look at current events, which I think we said before we turn the camera on is a little bit tricky. Things are moving very quickly right now. Uh, we've been mentioning tensions over in the Middle East really escalating at the moment. Any thoughts on how that could impact gold and perhaps the wider commodity space, keeping in mind, of course, how how fast things are going right now? Yeah, you know, well... Um, as we, we're recording this on whatever it is, Thursday, the third for people watching, um, it, it's an interesting day and in that the economic data today, the type of thing that would normally drive the news and the algos and prices was stronger than expected. And those headlines would normally prompt a higher dollar, higher interest rates, you know, a trimming of rate cut expectations. All those things happened. And normally gold and silver would sell off. But this geopolitical situation where everybody's waiting to see what how Israel is going to respond to that uh, ballistic missile barrage that they took uh, about two days ago, that's keeping a bid under gold and silver. And so, you know, there's this kind of unease going. And it could go either way. You know, back in April, remember the whole setup was uh, Israel had fired a missile into Damascus, Syria and hit the Iranian embassy and took out some guys. Um, and the Iranians responded. I mean, that's basically attack on their soil. Your embassy is your own sovereign territory. So the Iranians responded, you know, they flew in some drones and stuff. It was kind of symbolic almost. And so the Israelis then said, well, now we got to do something symbolic. And then that was it. And we went back to this kind of uneasy, whatever, uh, norm. And that may happen again. Um, you know, by the time people are watching this, maybe Israel, you know, will just do us, you know, say, yeah, see, look, we struck back. We can do this anytime we want, but they don't do anything really provocative or, you know, destructive. And then if that's the case, then oil, oil price will probably collapse and, and uh, we'll see what happens in the middle. But, you know, we could also, by this time next week, you know, maybe the whole Middle East is on fire. You know, and oil rigs are burning all through the area and, and the crude oil is spiking. And because of the economic damage, you know, people are talking about an emergency rate cut. Well, then what, then what the heck, you know, are the metals doing? So, you know, these are the kind of things that got me to stop day trading, actually, because they'll drive. I mean, these things will drive you crazy, right? Because how are you supposed to know what's going to happen? But yet you're placing bets on you know, on in the short term as to whether, you know, on events that you have no idea what's going to happen, you have no control. So in the end, I think it all augurs well for just owning gold, owning physical gold, physical silver, um, and, you know, dealing with the madness. But boy, uh, this is a perilous, tumultuous situation. And I think anybody that tries to tell you that they know exactly what's going to happen is... <laughs> I don't think they're telling the truth. Nobody knows what's going to happen. And uh, we're, we're all just 
we're all just spectators. Right. I think we'll, we'll see what happens by the time we, we post this. I think it does help to take that step back and just think about the overall picture. I'm going to bring up another event that's boiling kind of in the background here, which is the upcoming U.S. election, which I feel like I've been talking about it for a long time, and it's actually close now. So yeah. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that and the potential effects or, or lack thereof potentially on, on gold precious metals. You know, it, it will perpetuate um, the theme uh, and why I started my website in the first place, the theme of the site and why I started. I mean, it's coming up on 14 years ago, Charlotte. Um, and the reason I got involved in this in the first place is what we call the end of the great Keynesian experiment, this debt-based monetary system, which works fine for a while, but uh, the math is certain to catch up with it at some point. And that's why, you know, where you're just, you're growing the debt and servicing the debt and the interest costs, and it just starts to go exponential in the end. And that's a mathematical certainty. And I thought, well, we got time to prepare for this. And to me, the best way to do that is owning physical gold and, and physical silver too. And so um, regardless of who wins the election, um, that certainty is still out there. I, I think it's, I think it's comical that people still talk about, Oh, we're going to balance the budget, you know, and all that. No, you're not. They're never going to, that's just, re come on now. You probably also notice anybody watching either of the two debates. There were no questions about, I mean, everyone want to talk about, you know, uh, January 6th and, and illegal immigration, you know, and nobody wanted to talk about the debt. It's $35.7 trillion now. The interest cost servicing that debt is over a trillion dollars per year. This most recent price spike in gold began a couple of weeks ago when in the monthly budget numbers that are reported by the U.S. government, the deficit for August, just the month of August, was $380 billion. Now, you can't take that and just, you know, make it a run rate and annualize it and say, gosh, that's $4.5 trillion a year. Because there are some months like April when everybody's taxes are due that the deficit is, is you know, sometimes even positive. But you get a headline like that and it makes people, you know, the people that are responsible for managing money, you know, they have a fiduciary responsibility, allegedly, kind of grabs you by the lapels and shakes you a little bit. Wait a second. Did they say $380 billion for a month? We got to do something about that. Um and so that won't, that's not going to change. And I, uh, it doesn't matter who's president. It doesn't matter which party is in charge of either, you know, side of the U.S. Congress. This is going to continue. And if we are, in fact, heading into a recession, which I have no doubt that we are, if it hasn't already begun, then your tax revenues are going to plummet. The spending is only going to increase and that deficit and the total debt you're adding is going to widen out. Uh, on an annual basis. So anyway, um, I'm, I, I have no idea who's going to win the election. Um, but I think for people that are trying to plan for their financial security, to maintain their purchasing power, to, you know, see their way through this storm, um, it's whoever wins is still, you want to keep buying your gold and buying your silver. Okay, I think that's very solid advice for sure. So physical gold and silver, are there any, I'm curious if there's any other preparations that you could talk about that you're doing in these circumstances? In terms of the end of the Keynesian experiment or? <laughs> yes, yes. Just anything else you would mention that people might want to consider? Well, I, I would just, you know, here I, I, I speak in these absolutes, like, you know, mathematical certainty and all that kind of stuff. The thing we don't know is, you know, what is the magic number that it all starts to crumble? You know, if, if we were conducting this interview, you know, 12 years ago today, 13, you know, go back to 2011, I'd have been like, oh, Charlotte, I, I don't know if we're going to make it to next year, right? Because of, you know, quantitative easing and, you know, coming out of the great financial crisis. And, and here we are, 
you know, 13 years later with $35.7 trillion in debt. And somehow things are kind of not abnormal. I mean, I guess this is just kind of the world that we live in. Um, but there will be a point when it gets recognized that it's out of control, you know, and that, and there are financial implications. So anyway, a point in saying this is I, I know there are people that, you know, thinking that in 2011, you know, cashed out their IRA and bought nothing but gold. And then, then that's, you know, in the end, that's worked out okay. Um, you, you know, you just don't want to put, you know, all of your eggs in one basket, as they say. What you have to do is be diversified. The best thing I think people can do is just to, you know, in, in any investment is you just kind of dollar cost average over time. You take a little bit of money and you buy a little bit of stocks and you buy a little bit of this and you buy, you know, and you just gradually accumulate. But I think history has taught us that as you transition from one currency, failed currency regime to something new, our gold is the thing that gets included all the time so that there's a constant so that people can have confidence in it. Um, I'll ramble on for a second, if you don't mind. One of the, an interesting thing that happened a couple of, about a month ago, um, when the spot price first hit $2,500, did you see some of the, I kept seeing things on Twitter about, oh, a London bar of gold is now worth a million dollars. Remember seeing that? Um, yes, yes, yes. And I, and I thought, well, okay, that's interesting. Cause the London bar, those, you know, those bars, um, are 400 ounces. And again, it's not get into technicality. Some of them are a lot totally pure and all that stuff, but you get the idea. Well, if you go back to when Nixon closed the gold window in 1971 and the price was around $40, you know, that thing was, what's that? $16,000, right? If you go then fast forward about 25 years to the late nineties, year 2000, that thing's like $115,000. And now today it's a million. I mean, what, what better? I mean, it's the same bar of gold, right? I mean, what better example yeah. is there of the devaluation of your, you know, and the destruction of your purchasing power of the dollar over time? And so what happens? And again, like at the end of World War II, when the global economy is in tatters and we need to have a currency that everybody can use and trade in and rebuild things. Well, the U.S. had all the gold. The dollar was convertible into gold, and so everybody uses the dollar. So when you when you restart a currency system, you back it with gold. I mean, that's just how it has worked for millennia. And so that's why in this environment where we're transitioning and moving toward the end of one system and then, you know, something else, it's just wise to own some physical gold. I'd say that's probably why some of these central banks around the world are taking their dollars and buying gold. So it doesn't mean you cash out everything and buy a bunch of gold and go move to the mountains. You just pay attention. You just plan. You prepare accordingly, as we say, uh, for these events. We don't know when it's all going to come unraveling. And so, you know, in some regards, that's good because it gives a lot of people time that haven't prepared yet. But I think it's a pretty high degree of certainty that, you know, that this unraveling is coming. And so... Uh, you prepare, you monitor, you you know, you educate yourself, and you take some of your cash and you buy some gold. Okay, I think I think that helps, and it helps me a lot just to hear you acknowledge. Okay, we thought this was going to probably happen sooner, but it didn't. But we're going to yeah. keep preparing. So that that helps me situate it in my mind. So just to just to i think finish up on some of our points related to gold it feels a little bit silly to go back to something like this when we've just been looking at the really big picture but the fed uh, we should take at least a quick look at what is going on with the fed we had last month that first rate cut 50 basis points any sense on on what the fed's path forward is especially as you mentioned you think we are heading into a recession if not already there i was really surprised because you know jerry powell's a lawyer uh, not an economist. And he's a rather pragmatic fellow, it seems. Um, he's a Grateful Dead fan. So maybe that makes him more pragmatic. Maybe not. I don't know. But I thought for sure it'd be 25. And it was overwhelmingly they supported 50. A um, couple of things with that. One, you know, remember that 
all the talk about the inverted yield curve over the last couple of years, where the yield on the 10 year note in the US is higher than the yield or lower than the yield on the two year note, and how that's always a precursor of recession. And it is. But typically, or almost actually, it's eight of the last eight. It's when the curve uninverts and the 10 year yield moves back up higher than the two, that then you look back in hindsight, that's when the recession began. And that's what just happened within the last month. So yeah, I, I feel very confident that the recession that we've all been expecting is just now starting. So then let's go back to Jerry and his minions at the Fed. Remember the lag effect? Remember when they were hiking rates? That was, all, you know, well, we can hike, but well, because of that, like, you know, they only have a couple of dials and switches that they can mess with in monetary policy. And one of them is the Fed funds rate, the overnight rate. And they kept it low too long, which is at least part of the reason why we had CPI inflation get to 9%. They started hiking, but recognizing that it takes six, eight, nine, ten 10 months before any move trickles its way through, they started hiking, inflation kept going. And by the time they got rates up to 5%, then inflation starts coming down. But there's this lag effect. Okay, well, it's the same way on the way down. And that you can't cut rates and then immediately, you know, see the impact tomorrow. So getting back to this 50 basis point thing, Jerry knows that. And so when you see people on Twitter or, you know, I see interviews of people and they say, I can't believe the Fed is cutting rates when the stock market's near an all time high or the, the PMIs that we got this morning are bouncing back. Well, they're not cutting rates because of where we are, you know, here in September and October. They're trying to look over the horizon and try to think, where are we going to be by June of next year? So the fact that they cut 50 instead of 25, it kind of gives you a little window into what they're thinking. I mean, this recession that that I'm talking about that's just getting started, they must be thinking that too. And they want, they're trying to get ahead of the curve rather than wait too long like they waited with inflation and watch it get out of control. They wait too long. Now the recession is going to be far worse. And so I think that's why they're cutting now. Um, a lot of speculation. The next meeting concludes a day after the U.S. election in five weeks. Um, there was a lot of speculation that, that would be a 50 basis point cut. Right now, it's about one chance in three. It's certainly going to be 25. Um, it's about one chance in three. It might be 50. Um, a lot of the perception of that will, whether in reality of whether it be 25 or 50, will be determined by the next two uh, job numbers and unemployment rate. The next one coming up. Uh, as we record this tomorrow on the 4th, um, if those come in a little stronger than expected, then maybe we will end up at 25. But they're now on an easing cycle. There's no doubt about it. And I think people need to realize they're not cutting because of how things look right now. They're trying to figure out how it's going to be a year from now. And that's why they're cutting. Okay, good to have that context, I think. And you followed me down quite a number of paths today. So thank you for that. Before I let you go, are there any final thoughts you would leave investors with on where gold and silver are headed next or, or things we should be watching at the moment? Well, I, I would, I'm watching kind of commodities in general. Um, gold has moved sharply higher, obviously. And as I said, it's higher than it was in May, but silver is not. And the analogy I've used uh lots of times because I think it's it's valid is think of a little bit like a seesaw where you know you got gold on one end but you got copper on the other and silver's kind of in the middle you know so if gold goes up but copper's going down at the same time silver which is kind of a combination a little bit of monetary investment metal but mostly industrial gold goes up copper goes down silver just kind of sits there and you know as of a month, six weeks ago, here gold was up, copper was down 20%, so silver was down 10 from its highs. What's happening now is copper's responded and moved back up with China easing and you know everything that they're doing. And it's come back up about 15% off its lows, which has allowed silver to move back up. So let's watch commodities in general. Um, you know, if gold continues higher, and if copper makes a move back up toward $5 a pound, and some of the other industrial metals, crude oil, 
you know, geopolitical reasons or whatever, crude oil starts to, you know, trade back up toward 80 or something, silver is going to get a bid and it will rush to catch up again. I don't, you know, how far I, the next target is probably 35 or six from here. That's about 10%. Um, we get that 10, you know, and if we could finish the year around there, okay, we'd probably be set up then for another good year next year. So, um, that would be the, the thing I'd for everybody to watch if you're a silver investor or by extension, a mining share investor, watch the rest of the commodities. They'll give you a clue as to whether silver is about ready to take off. Okay. Many things to consider as we head toward the end of the year. So much has happened so far. And like you mentioned, still 90 days left. So hopefully we check back in with you fairly soon, but thank you. Thank you for coming on today to go over all of these different things. I thought that was really helpful. It's always fun, Charlotte. Thank you. Uh, call any time. And it'll, I'll sure be curious to see where is the things are the next time we speak. That's for sure. Crazy world. Me too. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Once again, I'm Charlotte McLeod with investingnews.com. And this is Craig Hemke with tfmetalsreport.com. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. We'd also love to hear your thoughts, so leave us a comment below. We'll see you next time.